Good afternoon and welcome to this parallel session on patient safety and infection prevention and control. One of the 10 sessions under the hospital operations track of the first National Hospital Week Research Forum. I would like to acknowledge attendance of the chiefs of hospitals and medical centers and other officials in this session. Good afternoon and welcome to our session. The call for abstracts for this research forum resulted in 212 submissions. These submissions underwent a stringent screening and selection process. In this session, we shall acquaint ourselves with three that have successfully qualified for presentation. Each of the researcher presenters in the session shall have 15 minutes to present their papers. After, we shall have 10 minutes to answer questions from the audience. Um, just to introduce ourselves, I am Dr. Bella Santos from the Health Facility Development Bureau. I am your session chair, and we have with us our session coordinator, Ms. Joy Padrigano from the Health Facility Development Bureau. Um, the audience is on mute in the entire session. You can post your questions on the chat panel of this virtual session room. You can see the button that will open the chat panel at the bottom of the screen. Maximum of one question per presenter only. Identify the presenter first, then your question next. And we do encourage you to post your questions as we do have time later for Q&A after the three presentations. Before we close this session, we shall have the synthesis and some onward announcements in the forum program. Presenters in this session are the following. Dr. Sherry Gracilia from Tonda Medical Center with infection control practices of the healthcare workers infected with COVID-19 in Tonda Medical Center from March 2020 to May 2021. Ms. Noor Fadzila and Yaman from Basilan General Hospital with the measures at the height of COVID-19, infection prevention and control practices among healthcare workers in a secondary healthcare facility. And Ms. Paula Ching from Dr. Jose and Rodriguez Memorial Hospital. A battlefield among Dr. Jose and Rodriguez Memorial Hospital workforce. COVID-19 infection among hospital employees. So our researchers, thank you for joining this forum and congratulations for reaching this far into this platform and initiative. Let us now start with the presentation of Dr. Griselia. Dr. Griselia, the floor is yours, Paul. Hello, good afternoon. We're just experiencing some technical difficulties. Let us give some time for Dr. Griselia to reconnect, Paul. Hello, Dr. Gracilia. Um, okay, I think we, we can proceed with our next presenter and we'll have Dr. Gracilia after this presentation. Na lang po. All right, um, give us some time. Lang po. Um, we'll be preparing the next book. Thank you. All right, for our next presentation, we have Ms. Yaman from Basilian General Hospital with measures at the height of COVID-19, infection prevention and control practices among healthcare workers in a secondary healthcare facility. I would like to welcome everyone to the first National Hospital Week Research Forum celebrating the theme, Hospital, Sandigan at Kaagapay sa Panahon ng Pandemia. In behalf of my institution, I would like to express our gratitude for this wonderful opportunity. Now, I would like to share our study entitled Measures at the Height of COVID-19, Infection Prevention and and Control Practices Among Healthcare Workers in a Secondary Healthcare Facility. Good day, everyone. I am Rufatsila M. Anyaman, a nurse, one of Basilan General Hospital. It is a DOH retained secondary healthcare facility, hospital, Sandigan, at Kaagapay sa panahon ng pandemia. In behalf of my institution, I would like to express our gratitude for this wonderful opportunity. Now, I would like to share our study entitled Measures at the Height of COVID-19, Infection Prevention and Control Practices Among Healthcare Workers in a Secondary Healthcare Facility. 
Good day, everyone. I am your Fatsila M. Anyaman, a nurse, one of Basel General Hospital. It is a DOH retained secondary healthcare facility situated at Isabela City, Basel, and Region 9 of Sambuanga Peninsula. I would like to start with the background of the study. To utter that the COVID-19 pandemic has altered our lives would be an understatement. The pandemic has changed how we work, learn, and interact as social distancing guidelines have led to a more virtual existence, both personally and professionally. This drastic changes has not exempt the healthcare setting. Instead, it urges the medical populace to the front lines. Infection prevention and control advocacies with a firm structure must exist in the hospital to provide quality care services at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Recently, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released an article stating that the promotion of a good IPC practice helps to improve conformity with recommended measures and thus subsequent risk reduction, provision of adequate staff and supplies, together with leadership and education of health workers, patients, and visitors. It is critical for an effective infection prevention and control measures in the healthcare setting. The essence of this study is to evaluate the infection prevention and control practices practiced among healthcare workers in a level 2 secondary healthcare facility. This will serve as baseline data in bridging the gap between the existing infection control practices and the drastic changes in the infection control measures brought about by COVID-19. Moving on to this conceptual framework. The researcher was able to exhaust the factors influencing IPC practices based on the collated data gathered from the survey questionnaire. These factors was extracted from the infection prevention and control assessment tool of WHO and CDC that was modified to fit a secondary healthcare facility. This tool is used to measure an institution's compliance on infection prevention and control practices. With the presence of the following factors, namely the management support, the availability of resources, the cooperation and collaboration, clear communication, dissemination of information, and the role of education. Well, this factors as a great significance in IPC practices because with its existence in an institution, this can aid in the hope of achieving a high compliance level that will then affect the IPC determinants, which are predetermined indicators set by CDC of good IPC practice. If these are adhered by the institution and the healthcare workers, the goal towards an effective IPC is met in the delivery of care at the height of COVID-19 pandemic. The goal of this study was to evaluate the infection prevention and control practices practiced among healthcare workers in a level 2 secondary healthcare facility at the height of COVID-19. Specifically, this study aimed to answer the following research questions. Number one, what determines the practice level of infection prevention control practices among healthcare workers in a secondary healthcare facility at the height of COVID-19 in terms of hand hygiene, adequate knowledge on doping and donning of personal protective equipment Equipment, programs for respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, cleaning and disinfection of devices in environmental surfaces, safe injection practices, and medication storage and handling. Number two, what are the factors that lead to a good practice of infection prevention control measures among healthcare workers in a secondary healthcare facility at the height of COVID-19? Now let's discuss the research methodology. The study employed a descriptive quantitative research design. It was utilized to evaluate the IPC practices by determining the compliance level and the practice level of healthcare workers in terms of IPC practices. A statistical tool guided by the fundamental statistical analysis, such as nominal scaling for the demographic data, ordinal scaling for the compliance level and the practice level, the representation of the result was shown through percentages. Purposive sampling technique was used because the researcher has set an inclusion and exclusion criteria that are befitting only to some respondents. Since this study was conducted in an in-house facility, it is beneficial for the institution and the researcher to employ this technique. The research response rate for the survey tool yield 100%, because out of 203 respondents, 203 of them submitted and accomplished the tool distributed. 
For the data gathering procedure, it was done after the validation of tool, the testing of reliability and validity to pilot testing and acquiring the approval from the Office of the Medical Center Chief. The researcher identified the respondents through purposive sampling, and it was explained to the respondents individually why they were selected to participate in the study. After the voluntary participation characterized through assigned informed consent, a scheduled interview was conducted in the area of designation at their preferred time. For the data collection, a self-administered questionnaire was developed to evaluate the healthcare worker's social demographic characteristics as regards to their age, education, gender, and work experience. The second part constitute the compliance to infection prevention and control practices factors that was assessed by 17 questions with corresponding awarding of points for each compliant and non-compliant answer. Correct responses were sent up to get a total compliant answer answers for each participant. Total score for all questions reached 17 grades. The compliance scores were classified into non-compliance, which is less than 50%, partial compliance ranging from 51 to 80%, and more than 80% is considered as full compliance. The latter part of the questionnaire consists of the practice level, which was assessed by 13 statement using a three-item Likert scale ranging from always with a corresponding score of 3 to never scored as 1. The practice scores were categorized into good, which is characterized by more than 80%, fair, ranging from 59 to 79%, and poor practice, yielding less than 59%. Effective infection prevention and control is central to providing high-quality health care for patients and a safe working environment for those that work in a healthcare settings. It is important to minimize the risk of spread of infection to patients and staff in hospital by implementing good infection control practices. The prevention and management of infection is the responsibility of healthcare workers working in a healthcare facility. In conformity with the, world, with, with, with the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease and Control Prevention, the guidelines on core components of infection prevention and control programs have been formulated to help healthcare facilities develop strategies to improve and strengthen IPC practices. An effective infection prevention and control practices of a healthcare facility serves as a foundation for a smooth hospital's operation. During this time, when the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted our lives, a healthcare facility now greatly leans on the infection prevention and control practices in place to combat this phenomenon. The key determinants of these practices, namely the practice of hand hygiene, the use of PPE, disseminated information on respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, in-place policies on cleaning and disinfection of devices, and environmental surfaces, safe injection practices, and proper medication storage and handling are indicators of good infection prevention and control practices in a secondary healthcare facility. The data collated from the respondents yield a positive outcome that indicates a full compliance level on these key determinants. The pandemic has caused us a drastic change in our infection prevention and control practices, but this will only strengthen the already established measures, if not augment, develop, and further enhance new strategies that is curated for our current circumstance brought about by COVID-19. The study was able to determine factors that influence an effective infection prevention and control practices that healthcare workers deemed substantial and essential fundamentally in developing methods to prevail against the COVID-19. These factors bridge the gap in the existing infection prevention and control measures we have whilst augmenting new formulated strategies curated for the drastic change brought about by COVID-19. The factors such as a good management support, 
the availability of resources for needed essentials that are fundamental in the daily operations of the hospital in combating the pandemic, a strong communication and dissemination of information through orientations, trainings, updates, and brief courses for healthcare workers in regard to effective IPC practices, and educating the healthcare worker in a continuous basis of his role as an advocate of an effective infection prevention control catalyst is perceived to be of great importance. Among the 203 respondents of healthcare workers, 203 exhibited good practice on hand hygiene, and it yielded 100%. On the use of PPE, 98.02% scored for good practice, whilst 1.97% scored for fair practice. With respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, 98.02% were of good practice, and 1.97% scored fair practice. Moving on to the cleaning and disinfection of devices and environmental surfaces, they exhibited good practice with 98.52% and 1.47% scored fair practice. For safe injection practices, it yielded 100% that indicates a good practice. For medication storage and handling, 99.51% demonstrated good practice and 0.49% exhibited fair practice. None of the respondents scored poor practice on the IPC determinants. Under management support, all of the respondents exhibited full compliance. Under the category of availability of resources, 171 respondents affirmed that the institution are fully compliant, whilst 32 respondents were identified as partially compliant. Under cooperation and collaboration, 191 respondents were identified to be fully compliant, and 12 respondents were noted to be partially compliant. In communication and dissemination, it was evident that there are 182 respondents were identified as full compliant, and 20 respondents were noted to be partially compliant. Lastly, in education, the results showed a fully compliant respondents, and there were no respondents under the category of partially and non-compliant. Majority of the identified factors influencing an effective IPC practices exhibited full compliant population. The implementation and practice of the six key determinants by the healthcare workers lead to good practice because the respondents were provided with the five influencing factors that contributes to an effective infection prevention and control practices, namely the management support, the availability of resources, cooperation and collaboration, communication and dissemination, and education. Effective infection prevention and control practices, we can say that it is a successful infection prevention and control practice because it requires a prompt implementation of factors influencing good practice of IPC that a healthcare facility must adhere to in congruent with the IPC determinants to yield an effective IPC practices. For the recommendations, we recommend that we refurbish the knowledge and practice of healthcare workers through continuing in-service educational programs, emphasizing the importance of following latest evidence-based practices of infection control in continuing education, training, and programs, providing training programs for newly hired healthcare workers about infection control and at regular intervals. A replication of this study using observation checklists should be done to assess the level of practice in a more in-depth perspective. I would like to end my presentation with a thank you note. I hope you would have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ms. Yemen, for your presentation. Um, we will now move on to Dr. Shaya Gracilia from Tonda Medical Center with infection control practices of healthcare workers infected with COVID-19 in on the Medical Center from March 2020 to May 2021. Hello, Doc. Good afternoon. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I am to present you 
on March 2020. This research has conducted a spot of the section of the program to formulate its own and implement methods related to protection in general and COVID 19 in particular. I am Dr. Garcia, the presenter of this study. COVID 19 has brutalized our the forefront of the battle against this pandemic. The pandemic has silent and extend to each protecting healthcare workers is key to ensuring a functional health system and a functional society. No country has a society can keep each safe unless its healthcare workers receive. That is why reducing their protection control promises is imperative in protecting their health and the patient's concern. According to the WHO, infection prevention involves uh, evidence-based approach designed to prevent or foster infection to patients and their workers. Mm -hmm. Infection prevention and control must be all known. It's basically everyone's concern. slides so uh, where is it now okay um as a, okay as as a matter of fact in our hospital nearly four out of every 10 staff have already been infected with covid-19 so the Tondo medical center has its contribution to the covid-19 census of the country not only patients were affected but a significant number of healthcare workers in the hospital were also infected with the virus, causing management concern. So the general objective of this study is to determine the infection control practices of healthcare workers infected with COVID-19 in Tondo Medical Center from March 2020 to May 2021, and specifically to describe the demographic characteristic, clustering of cases, and so on. For the methodology, this is a descriptive retrospective study. And for my research subjects are the following healthcare workers. The data were extracted from the ICC database utilizing the COVID-19 outbreak investigation survey through online Google form or by filling out a print copy. For my data analysis and, connect and collection are the following. For the results and discussion, 425 healthcare workers developed COVID-19. There were two non-respondents leaving 423 participants, and the mean age of affected was 36.4 years old. More females and singer, single were also infected. This profile was similar to those of Sabatchan in southwest Iran in terms of age and sex. As to area of work assignment, most cases came from the blue-green zone or low to lowest risk areas, followed by the orange zone or moderate risk, risk areas, whereas the red zone or the high risk areas being the least affected area comparable to the findings of Alajmi in Qatar. This could be attributed to a heightened sense of danger of being exposed to high risk areas which has resulted to more stringent IPC practice. Alajmi also noted a less stringent use of PPE among healthcare workers in lowest risk areas. 
With the right measures, public transport is COVID safe. Although most of the healthcare workers reported to work using private vehicles, the rest relied on jeepneys, for which we cannot always guarantee that the disinfection of the plastic barriers is maintained and that the maximum number of passengers is met. Almost 80% of our cases came from Manila, specifically Tondo and Kamanaba, where there has been significant community transmission. NCR has continuously had the highest number of COVID-19 cases. Manila placed third among top cities or provinces after Quezon City and Cavite. Three clusters of COVID-19 cases were observed, and there was an increasing trend of cases from the third to the third cluster. The duration of each cluster increased from two to three to four months from the first to the third clustering, respectively. The first clustering from March to April 2020 coincided with the first occurrences of COVID-19 cases in MCR when ECQ in Luzon was implemented on March 17, 2020. The second clustering from June to August 2020 occurred almost concurrently after placing the Metro Manila and other cities under modified ECQ in May 15, 2020, which resulted to Philippines another COVID-19 cases surge. The third clustering from January to May of this year could be related to the emergence of the COVID-19 UK variant, which was detected in the Philippines on January 7, 2021. From then on, the country has so far logged cases of the Alpha, Beta, Delta, and Gamma variants. The persistence of this community transmission, particularly in the MCR+, plus, and the emergence of new COVID-19 variants that are more transmissible, may have influenced COVID-19 class case clustering among Tondo Medical Center healthcare workers. As shown in this table, more than half of the respondents had an unknown exposure. And for the known source of exposure, housemates or relatives top the list, followed by co-workers. Patients and friends were the least source of infection, and this could be better seen in the figure with color representation, green representing the unknown exposure, orange the housemates and relatives, and so on. It is in line with what is known about community transmission, which means that the virus is spreading in the community from an unknown source. For those with known source of exposure, housemates or relatives and co-workers were the most common sources similar to the results of Almascari. A CDC-supported study in 2020 showed that COVID-19 also spreads within home often, quickly, and among both, among both adults and children. Patients were the least source of exposure in Tondo Medical Center, further supporting the jury that the healthcare workers assigned in the high-risk areas used PPE more dutifully and followed infection control practices more religiously. For the symptomatology, three out of ten respondents were asymptomatic and majority had mild symptoms. Difficulty of breathing or shortness of breath as the most severe symptoms. And the most common symptoms was loss of taste and smell, followed by cough, sore throat, and colds. In the report cited, cough was consistently the most common symptom of COVID-19. For the comparison of adherence to wearing of masks, it was highest in the community, followed by the workplace and least at home. Majority practice social distancing in the community and in the workplace than at home. Household transmission may be attributed to laxity of infection control practices at home. Meanwhile, other household members may not be consistently practicing anti-COVID measure outside the home. The strict infection control methods at home may appear unrealistic, but they must be reassessed particularly in households with highly vulnerable family members. 
The WHO standard recommendation for the duration of hand washing is 40 to 60 seconds, while for the hand hygiene, it's, it is 20 to 30 seconds. This is an area that needs to be addressed in order to improve the practice. Only one to two out of 10 healthcare worker, workers wash their hands for 40 seconds and more and in, in the workplace and at home, and majority employ hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand rub for less than 20 seconds in the workplace and at home. For the respiratory hygiene, most of the healthcare workers, but not all, followed standard cup etiquette. Items commonly used to cover the mouth or nose when sneezing were tissue, mask, and handkerchief. For the meal practice, more than half of the healthcare workers eat at the pantry most of the time alone or with co-workers. Most of the staff eat at the dining table at home either alone in more than half of the cases or with housemates. A French study published in February 8, 2020 has confirmed that gathering with family and friends over meals increases the risk of contracting COVID-19 and as per DPI, and dollar recommendation, employers shall adopt staggered meal, meal schedules. Eating alone in the workstation is highly encouraged. Most of the healthcare workers were decontaminating their work area before and after work. Seven out of 10 staff performed decontamination of their houses daily. Others did it once a week or monthly. Although the environment should be preferably clean and disinfected using sodium hydrochloric solution or the commonly known sun rocks, in this study, alcohol was the most utilized agent in the contamination of the workplace and at home, followed by sodium hypochlorite, soap, and water. For other disinfection pra practices, most of the respondents clean their cell phones daily. Mobile fo phones may serve as vehicles of infection transmission. Therefore, we must clean and disinfect them. Accessibility of the alcohol is important to ensure practice of hand hygiene. Majority of the healthcare workers brought, uh, brought alcohol with them. According to the CDC guideline, medical masks are designed for single use and will deteriorate with prolonged use. Almost half of the respondents wore masks for four to eight hours only. In conclusion, some gaps have been identified in the knowledge and practices of infection control of healthcare workers infected with COVID-19 at Tondo Medical Center. Hence, for the recommendation, reinforcement programs including refresher trainings, and policy enhancements are warranted. And as healthcare workers, we must be vigilant enough, be a proactive and diligent health educators to our family and relatives, reminding them to be always mindful of their practices. Employ consistent anti-COVID measures everywhere we go, especially at our home and during encounter with our relatives. We also recommend that more researches be conducted, particularly analytical studies such as the following. With that, maraming salamat po at mabuhay po tayong lahat, mga manggagawang pangkalusugan sa panahon ng pandemya. Salamat. Thank you so much, Dr. Grisilia, for your presentation. All right, would like to remind po again our participants and attendees that you may post your questions in our chat panel at the bottom part of the page. Um, we will have time later for question and answer. All right, okay, so last but not least, um, we have Ms. Paula Ching from Dr. Jose N. Rodriguez Memorial Hospital with a battlefield among Dr. Jose N. Rodriguez Memorial Hospital workforce, COVID-19 infection among hospital employees. All right, the floor is yours, but Ms. Paula. Good afternoon, everyone. I am privileged to present to you our undertaking entitled A Battlefield Among Dr. Jose and Rodriguez Memorial Hospital and Sanitarium Workforce COVID-19 Infection Among Hospital Employees. 
I am Paola Katrina G. Ching, nurse three from Dr. San Rodriguez Memorial Hospital and Sanitary. COVID-19 pandemic made us realize that health workers are of paramount importance to any healthcare system to guarantee access to quality care. According to the World Health Organization data, health workers represent less than 3% of the population of most countries, yet 14% of the COVID-19 cases occurred among them. Besides their proximity to potentially infected people, health workers work in extraordinary and extremely challenging conditions which introduced new occupational health hazards. Stress, fatigue, fear, violence, harassment, discrimination, and social stigma were the identified COVID-19 effects with depression, anxiety, and psychological distress as the most common. Most common. In the Philippines, 133 out of the 501st COVID-19 cases were healthcare workers. In this study, it was reported that healthcare workers were more likely to report risk of exposure in the workplace, to have parietal symptoms and be admitted within 14 days from symptom onset as mild to moderate case. DJNRMHS, previously Tala Leprosarium, is a tertiary hospital situated in North Caloocan and boundary of Bulacan. It was designated as an exclusive COVID-19 referral hospital for the National Capital Region along with two other institutions on March 2020. In the country, there is no sufficient data and studies on occupational health issues in healthcare facilities, as well as limited information about COVID-19 epidemiological characteristics among healthcare workers. Hence, this study with the following objectives. For the methodology, we conducted a descriptive cross-sectional study. All employees, regardless of employment status, who tested positive through RT-PCR from March 2020 to May 2021 were included. Information on COVID-19 infected employees were obtained through review of records such as COVID-19 case investigation forms, contact tracing anecdotes, and accomplished forms. Database of the COVID-19 cases were also obtained and reviewed. These data were checked for double entries, missing data, and inconsistencies. An institutional case definition was developed together with the infectious disease specialist, epidemiologist, and contact tracing team headed by the family medicine physician in establishing possible exposures resulting to COVID-19 infection. Data were included in MS Excel and were analyzed using simple descriptive statistics through pivot tables. Classification was established through defining infection as hospital acquired, work related, community related, or evident breach on IPC measures. For the results and discussion, from May 2020 to May 2021, a total of 4,025 confirmed COVID-19 admissions were catered by the hospital, of which 410 or 10% were hospital employees. As seen on this slide, there is also an increased trend among employees infected during reported COVID-19 transmission in the community as evidenced by two peaks on our graph. In 2020, represented in yellow bar graph, Cases target to increase on morbidity week 27, with peaks on morbidity weeks 28 and 34, accounting 25 cases or 6% of the employee infection. In 2021, those of the line graph, peak was also noted on morbidity weeks 11 to 16, so that's uh, between March to April, with a total of 128 cases. It is the same month when a second wave was also reported. For the demographic profile, 52% of the infected employees were males, with most affected cases in the age range of 30 to 39 years. Youngest employee affected is 21 years and oldest at 64 years old. Majority of the cases were symptomatic, holding plenty of position, and assigned at the clinical area. There was a high percentage of admission with one death reported. Disease severity were classified to be between mild to moderate level. For those assigned in the clinical area, nurses, nursing attendant, and doctors were mostly affected. There was also a high number of cases among the outsourced housekeeping staff. 201 or 49% of the accounted infection was established to be due to hospital exposure. 151 or 36.8 of the COVID-19 infection were community acquired. 55 or 13.4 were work related and with 3 or 0.7% due to evident breach on the use of PPE. 38 cases or 9% were infected following high-risk exposure from a positive employee. These 38 cases were exposed to positive employee through unprotected exposures 
to unknowingly COVID-19 case, such as through eating and sharing meals together. There were 12 employees with recorded second COVID-19 infection with one month to 10 month interval following their first positivity. However, upon clear examination of the cycle threshold and judgment of the infectious disease specialist, three infections were classified as remnants from previous infection. Our initiative to establish occupational safety and health, a designated committee was created in response to COVID-19. This was the same time period where a joint memorandum between Civil Service Commission, DOH, and DOLE was issued with the subject occupational safety and health standards for the public sector. Pre-pandemic, we already have an ongoing patient safety program as outlined on our performance governance system roadmap for 2021 to 2028. OSH activities includes the prioritization and the following components. Engineering and environmental controls includes use of plastic barriers for isolating patients, repurposing of wards with consideration on adequate ventilation, use of technology in the operating room, traffic flow, designation of clean and dirty areas, and installation of surveillance cameras in dining and buffing as well as in the patient's room. Administrative controls established includes a creation of guidelines in relation to symptomatic employees, quarantine protocols, return to work, and mitigation of, of staff shortages. Work from home arrangements were also instituted in the offices. Regular IPC orientation were conducted. Pre duty teams are oriented before deployment. Regular updates and reorientation were also held, especially following reports on breach of IPC. COVID-19 training unit has recorded 109 training sessions in 2020 and 36 sessions in 2021. Um, uh, in administrative controls, there are 316 additional manpower hired. And the rational use of PPE were instructed in offices and other areas to ensure optimum use. Staff surveillance, this includes the monitoring of healthcare workers assigned in the COVID ward after seven days of duty. During the quarantine, they were placed in an isolation facility where they were monitored for any signs and symptoms and are then tested on the seventh day of their quarantine. Other symptomatic employees were isolated and tested. Medical clearance was required prior to reporting back on duty. Other considerations such as high-risk employees with existing medical conditions and are pregnant were placed on low-risk areas such as offices. By January 2021, all personnel were mandated to undergo twice a month swapping, this time including office personnel and others in low-risk areas. Of the 21,733 employees tested, 350 positive employees were detected with a positivity rate of 1.6%. The conduct of post-deployment counseling among COVID-19 teams, management support through welcoming teams prior to deployment, and awarding of certificate of appreciation post duty were some of our psychological and social support activities. The Mental Health Specialty Center was able to conduct 52 individual sessions of counseling during the pandemic. Contact tracing and risk assessment was the highlight of the OSH. Contact tracing immediately follows upon receiving a positive RT-PCR result or notification from an exposed employee within one day to five days. These 410 cases had 4,614 other hospital employees contact traced. In conclusion, majority of the affected were males, age ranging from 30 to 39 years. Nurses and nursing attendants were highly infected. Similarly, with the local literature, most were symptomatic and are classified as mild to moderate. Aside from hospital exposure, clinical and non-clinical employees can be infected through community exposure and unprotected interactions among unknowingly infected co-workers. Routine or mandatory swabbing has been useful aid for detecting infection among employees. Also, our institution has incorporated OSH on its COVID-19 daily operations with focus on engineering controls, admin controls, and capacitating programs, timely contact tracing, risk stratification, quarantine and mitigation protocols, and mandatory COVID-19 screening aided in the control of hospital-wide infection transmission. The prioritization of healthcare worker safety and protection has resulted to undisrupted service delivery. For the recommendations to the hospital to continue monitoring employee compliance on mandatory swabbing, to link OSH practices to achieve, to achieve patient safety goals, to strengthen implementation of OSH during crisis and non-crisis situation, and conduct qualitative study on the impact of OSH activities. For the Department of Health to continue monitoring, 
to harmonize data on reported COVID-19 to develop guide on implementation of OSH in healthcare facilities, to incorporate OSH component on national strategies, and to connect health for worker safety policies to existing patient safety policies and programs, and to Dole and civil service to continue collaborating with the lead agencies in strengthening OSH, especially during pandemic. Outcome of healthcare workers' prioritization are as follows. And our loud pride to strengthen healthcare workers' health, our initiative was submitted as an entry to the International Hospital Federation Awards in 2021. Thank you so much. And through unity and strength, we can combat COVID-19. Thank you so much, Ms. Paula Ching, for your presentation. Um, as we are done with the few presentations, we are now in our Q&A. All right. Um, you may now post your questions in our chat panel at the bottom part of the page. All right, I think um, hearing none, you will now proceed with our synthesis for this particular session. So in our first study um, with Ms. Anyaman and the measures in the height of COVID-19, from their study, it was noted that there was high compliance rate among the healthcare workers in their health facility. And there were five important factors that were identified, which are management support, availability of resources, cooperation and collaboration, communication and dissemination, and education. The findings of the study emphasized the importance of following latest evidence-based practices of IPC, conducting training programs for newly hired, um, workers and the replication of the study using observation checklists. From the presentation of Dr. Gisilia and in infection control practices of healthcare workers infected with COVID-19 in Tonto Medical Center, um, there were gaps identified in the IPC knowledge and practices of the healthcare, worker, healthcare workers. The recommendations are to reinforce the programs including refresher trainings and policy enhancement. We also saw the importance of being health educators to family and relatives and to practice IPC um, protocols inside and outside of the hospital. Lastly, as presented by Ms. Ching, with a battlefield among Dr. Jose and Rodriguez Memorial Hospital, um, this study aimed to describe the demographic profile of the healthcare workers infected with COVID-19. Um, different exposures were noted hospital acquired work related community exposure in breach and IPC protocols. The fields um, where they intervened were engineering controls, administrative controls, PPE, staff surveillance, psychological, staff surveillance, psychological, and social support. So as showed by these three presentations, which are very timely, um, there are interventions that can be done by a health facility to ensure the safety of their healthcare workers, especially in this pandemic. It is recommended to conduct regular assessment of knowledge and skills of our healthcare workers and controls in our health facilities. Appropriate and timely improvements in our IPC knowledge and practices are warranted for the safety of our healthcare workers and patients. All right, um, Ms. Joy has um, given the link to the evaluation sheet. Oh, I think it's for tomorrow, but the attendance sheet link is in the chat panel. So please do fill out that form. And that's all the time we have for this parallel session on patient safety and infection prevention and control of the hospital operations track of the first National Hospital Research Week Forum. Uh, make sure you're all able to log into your next parallel session tomorrow. And as some of you are aware, there are 30 papers out of 60 presented in this forum that are in the running for best research paper. The winners will be announced and awarded at the closing plenary session of this forum. We also expect all of you to join them. Before the first National Hospital Week Research Forum formally closes, the link to the post-activity evaluation form will be announced and posted. Um, all those who will be able to fill up the online post-activity evaluation 
will receive a certificate of attendance and return. So it will be um, given tomorrow after the closing ceremony. This parallel session has concluded and thank you all for your participation. You may now click on the leave button or the round X button in the bottom right of the screen. See you all at the closing and awarding ceremony. Maraming salamat po.